A light breeze blew along the coast, just enough to provide a refreshing feeling as the three friends worked on the dock. They had been waiting all winter for this day, and they were not about to waste it. The sun sat just inches above the horizon as they untied the lines and prepared to sail. As the ship left the inlet, Fred smiled and clutched the wheel tight. It had taken a lot of convincing before his father would finally let him borrow what he considered his prized possession, and everything he had to do to earn the chance made it even sweeter. His family had money, but his parents had never been the type to spoil him. His father, in particular, was keen on him earning his own way and expected more out of him than his friends' fathers expected from their sons. Jerry sat in the co-captain's chair, always happy to be at Fred's side. The two had known each other since they were in diapers, and rarely was one seen without the other. The only time they hadn't been together was the one year that Fred had been sent off to a private school in England, and that was the year that Jerry had been arrested at a house party. Their parents got together after that incident and decided to never split the boys up again. Leo was the oddball of the trio, having only met Jerry and Fred a couple of years prior at freshman orientation. He'd been an outcast most of his life, which was probably what brought him into the pair of friends like a powerful magnet attracted to iron. He'd been accepted into both families as if he'd been around them his whole life, almost making up for the fact that he hadn't really had his own family since he was six. As the small yacht moved out to sea, Fred turned on some music and the three friends chatted about the end of the school year and what classes had been their favorite. Jerry and Leo teased Fred about why he didn't ask out the TA in his chemistry class, turning his cheeks a bright shade of red. She just wasn't my type. I could tell by the way she talked, he explained. You mean you could tell by the way she talked to other guys, Leo laughed. Seriously, though, what about that girl in your psych class, uh, Vanessa? Jerry asked. She moved back to Nova Scotia this summer, said she missed her parents too much, Fred said. The talk of girls lasted the next couple of hours as they moved to the fishing spot they had picked out several months prior. It was supposed to be teeming with sea bass and they couldn't wait to catch a few for dinner later that evening. As they arrived at the spot, they made their way down to the main deck and set up their rigs. Jerry's dad had loaned them his equipment, showing them the basics and trusting them to be smart enough to figure the rest out. By early afternoon, they each had a line in the water and a cold beer in hand. This whole being an adult thing really isn't too bad, Leo said as he laid back in his chair. Yeah, it's like being a kid, but with cooler toys, Fred chuckled as he watched the tip of his rod move with the sea. The afternoon meandered along, and none of them got even a single bite. They checked their hooks every couple of hours, making sure the bait was still there, even swapping for fresh bait a couple of times. By early evening, it was clear they weren't going to have much luck. Should we move to a different spot? Maybe the fish have wised up and gone somewhere else to avoid us, Leo said, imagining a school of fish watching them approach and heading the other way. Maybe that's a good idea, Jerry agreed. I don't really want to move this late. It'll be dark soon. We'll try another spot tomorrow and head back Wednesday if we don't get anything, Fred responded. Reeling their lines in for the day, the three made their way below deck into the galley for dinner. After a quick meal... They spent a few minutes on deck watching the sunset before Fred and Leo made their way below deck to rest while Jerry took the first night watch. They each had to cover about three hours, with Leo covering the middle shift after losing at rock, paper, scissors. The sun rose the next morning, revealing storm clouds to the west. They hadn't anticipated any bad weather, and after checking the radar and listening to the shipping forecast, they decided the system was likely going south, and they set a course to the north. By midday, the clouds were gone and they were enjoying clear skies once more. The new site they had identified was only a few hours away and they expected to be there by lunchtime. Just after 10 a.m., however, Leo spotted something else unexpected on the horizon. Land ho! he shouted in what he thought was a perfect pirate accent. There isn't supposed to be any land around here. The closest island is nearly 500 kilometers away. 
Fred said as he rechecked his charts. Maybe it's just a mirage, Jerry guessed. As they moved closer, it became apparent that it was more than just a trick of the eye. A rather large island had grown out of the ocean, and it definitely wasn't on any map they had. Fred checked his coordinates several times to make sure they were right, finding the same result each time. Slowing the boat as they crept closer to shore, Fred reached for the radio to report what they were seeing. Before he could call anyone, though, Jerry stopped him. Wait until we check it out. This could be our chance to be the first to set foot on an uncharted island. Imagine how awesome it'll be to be known as the guys who discovered the island with dinosaurs, or maybe a giant diamond on it, like in some movie. Jerry was grinning from ear to ear as he spoke. Against his better judgment, Fred put the radio down and smiled back. The least they could do was check it out first. It didn't really look like anyone else was there, so maybe they would be the first people to set foot on it. Making sure the anchor was secure, they climbed in the small raft the boat held and made their way slowly to shore. As they reached the shallow area of the beach, they climbed out and pulled the raft onto the sand, looking around in awe as they moved. The beach itself wasn't too large, made up of the widest sand they had ever seen and only going back a few meters before the plants took over. The jungle looked to be much thicker than it appeared to be from the boat, but they were carrying machetes that would make quick work of the growth when needed. Taking a few steps toward the forest, Fred thought he saw something hidden behind some of the plants just inside the tree line. As he moved closer, he realized it was a sign of some kind. Reaching it, he moved the plants aside to reveal a small, wooden board with a skull and bones carved into it along with some lettering. Isla Abananada? Fred whispered. Forsaken Island, Leo said. Well, there goes our dreams of fame and fortune, Jerry responded. Maybe it's some kind of joke. Someone found the island, left the sign for fun in case anyone else found it. Or maybe they're still here and they just want to scare people off, Leo suggested. Either way, it can't hurt to look around a little. Not going to lie, my curiosity has the better of me now, Fred said, looking at the others with a glint in his eye. With no objections, the three friends made their way beyond the sign, pushing through the foliage and foraging a path. It was easy to see where they'd been, but the growth made for slow going. After about 30 minutes of cutting through vines and leaves, they broke through into a clearing. The short grass was a welcome sight, with the full picture of the island starting to take shape in front of them. The field was large, at least a kilometer across, and on the other side, there was more force sitting at the base of what looked like a small volcano. As they looked over the massive area, Leo spotted something in the distance. Is that a house? It definitely looks like one, Fred replied. Nervous, but now more curious than before, the group made their way across the field toward the small abode. It took at least 15 minutes to make it, walking uphill through the grass most of the way. The one saving grace was a dirt path that emerged as they drew closer, most likely made by the inhabitants of the building that led them straight to the front porch. Walking up the wooden steps, Fred knocked and waited for a response. After a few minutes, it was clear that there was no one home, or at least no one that was coming to the door and he looked back at the others for ideas. Without saying a word, Leo leaned forward and turned the knob, causing the door to creak open. What'd you do that for? Fred asked. Well, we know it's unlocked now, but it looks like it's been abandoned for years anyway. No harm in looking around, Leo said. Yeah, come on, you suggested looking around. Why not just a little bit more? Jerry agreed. They crept through the doorway, Fred first. The dust and cobwebs that littered the first room made it clear that no one had been there for some time. Making sure they were all on the same page, they split up to investigate the rooms that bordered the main area. Jerry found himself in a small kitchen with a makeshift stove and sink on one side and some shelves, presumably for storing food, on the other. A small table with a chair near the window in the back of the room must have been used at one point for meals. There were some moldy remnants of what might have been vegetables on the shelf, and dust covered everything. Leo discovered a small bathroom with a toilet and a tub, which looked like they had been on a boat at some point. 
it appeared that whoever had lived here was experienced with plumbing, as there were basic pipes leading out of the room, spilling outside. The setup looked rather sturdy for how long it must have been sitting unused. As Jerry and Leo were finishing up, they heard Fred yell for them from his room. Guys, you need to see this. They made their way to him, finding him in a bedroom with a small bed and a side table. He was sitting on the mattress and he had a book in his hand. Before they could ask what he found, he started reading. June 2nd, 1965. It's been seven months and things just keep getting weirder. This place seems so perfect, but it turns out it may have been too perfect. That thing that's been stalking me is coming nearer every night and I don't know how much longer it'll be before it gets to the nerve to try again. I'm down to my last bullet and I might be smarter to use it on myself at this point. If I ever get off this godforsaken island, I'll never leave society again. His voice trailed off as he read the final word. Is that it? Jerry asked. There's other entries. I skimmed them, but whoever it was really didn't elaborate much more, Fred said. Well, that's enough for me. We need to get back to the boat and get out of here, Leo said, moving for the door. The other two joined him and they retraced their steps back to the beach. As they stepped out of the forest, they were shocked to see the raft gone and the boat floating much further offshore than they had left it. Panic started to set in as they realized that it was also starting to get dark. They had no lights, no food, no water, and no one knew where they were. As if that wasn't enough, Leo noticed something in the wet sand where the raft had been. Walking closer to see what it was, they found a large footprint with four toes and massive claws that definitely hadn't been there when they arrived. The only thing they could think to do was sprint back to the cabin and pray that whatever was out there didn't get them first. Years later, another group would find the island during an otherwise normal day of sailing. Making their way on shore, they would find a wooden sign standing above a shallow grave that contained a skeleton holding a gun. The sign read, Forsaken Island, Leo and Jerry gone, last resort, leave now or die. Life's the truth.